Well, folks, as you can see, I have Aristo with me again today. And the title of his uh, talk this morning is going to be How to Treat a Wake-Up Call. Aristo? Thank you, Ron. Ron has no clue what I'm going to talk about because you know, I just threw this title at him after a long discussion about, you know, time and schedules and keeping everything, you know, commitments and stuff like that. Um, and most people I know are into, you know, saying I'm going to be there at this time or some people and the other side may say, yeah, but you're kind of telling me that we have to be there at this time. Can't we just be more flexible? The fact is that for better or worse, our lives are compartmentalized. So we tend to respond to key events, key stimuli in, the, in, in our lives in, in the course of events. So, and we have words for these. One of these words is the wake up call. You go to a hotel and you have no timepiece that tells you when, when is when, you know, we are conditioned to know that time has certain compartments and these have, and duration has a name, seconds, minutes, whatever. And we organize our lives around these signposts. What do we do without the signpost? Well, nature has a few signposts. It has the sun up, the sun down, you know, the position of the sun, but it doesn't have the exactitude of the regimenting that our society has put us. Now, the interesting thing is a computer is based on this type of thing. It's based on a clock. It's called a system clock. And this thing has a frequency, basically just like the ticking of a, the seconds of a you know, normal clock. And it is that. It has a quartz crystal and it has, you know, it goes in the, in the nanoseconds, microseconds, and, you know, tick, 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 tick. Everything it does, it's like, it's like a slave galley, okay? And you have boom, boom, the guy with a drum, and everybody rows according to that rhythm. So imagine that different people are rowing at different paces, or is my uh, image going... Yeah, it, you faded out and then started coming back again, and it's a little bit blurry right at the moment. Okay, let me see if this has anything to do with it. Well, it's okay. Uh, as long as my, my voice is still Your voice here. is clear. <laughs> okay. even, even when you're faded out, your voice didn't fade out. Okay, it'll come Just back in, at some in the point. Video, so. not the audio. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyways, viewers are the few that have remained, the tried and the true, you know, you're used to all of these things happening. The point is, again, back to the topic, is that we are dancing to the beat, we are marching to the beat of a specific drummer. Those who are original, they are not off the drum, they don't go off by themselves doing whatever they please, whatever, they still march to a beat. It may be of a different drummer. You see, even our, our euphemisms are all about keeping the pace are all about keeping a rhythm. Yeah, and you say, well, uh, the body has a rhythm, everything vibrates. Yeah, but there is no specific system clock that tells us we have to all vibrate in coherence to that. Everything actually vibrates in coherence to the other. We may identify a system clock, say the heart's the system clock, or the brain waves, but all of these things kind of fluctuate. And so you don't have a specific um, master rhythm in that sense. All rhythms are interdependent. You may call them codependent. The point is that the wake-up call is one of those signposts. It's part of that rhythm. So wake, that, that's very interesting because, you know, we use the euphemism in the alternative community, so to speak. Um, when somebody is, you know, into the same old, same old, and society is run like this, whatever they tell you, you know, whatever you're told, um, because, of course, if you use the word they too much in this context, then you're, you're, you're insane. Then, you know, it's a stereotype, you know, insane people speak about them, you know, and they, and oh, who are they, you know. So it's an indefinite threat. So in any case, the wake-up call is, gets you up, so you may still be in the rhythm of the situation, but this time you are perceiving and, and understanding hopefully what's going on around you. Now the point is, you're not free, okay? So how do you know, I mean, if you get a wake-up call, how do you know that you didn't fall back asleep? 
Well, you get up out of bed, you go through the day, and hopefully you are marching at least to the beat of a different drummer, so to speak, so you can tell the difference between drummer A and drummer B. You know, the drummer of, that, that you hear when you're asleep and the drummer that you hear when you're awake. However, sometimes the alarm clock goes off and we tend to fall back asleep and we dream that we're awake. So this wake-up call, how do you know, what are you talking about now? Well, listen to the metaphor. The metaphor is that first, even when you're awake, you're still dependent on a master beat, a master drummer, a master, you know, clock. This may help you organize, but in the end, you know, is life that regimented? Is life that square? Does life have corners? Maybe if life, the life you knew has four corners, now you're in a life with five corners and you think you're free. One more corner to, to, to register. So all of this is relative. And the reason I'm saying it is that I believe it's important, at least for some of us, you know, I believe we're past the age of saying, let's wake people up. You know, let's wake everybody up. The people who would have awoken up are awake or at least still awake. And now there's the process of let's not fall back asleep. That should be the priority because at this point, there's a, a kind of collective backlash, you might say, to the whatever happened in the 90s and the first decade of the 2000s of, um, you know, internet alternative wakefulness, so to speak. And now it's almost trying to reverse. It's like the tide coming in and then going back out. Um, so let's just put it that way. Let's not say that the establishment is doing counter intelligence or, you know, um, a counter coup or whatever, a counter um, movement against the original wake up that was there and allowed in the first place, relatively speaking, uh, because to see how it happens and, you know, how to deal with it. In the 80s, there were conspiracy theories, you know, but if you went out and talked about those, you could lose your job, literally. I mean, people would say, even up to the 80s, in the 70s, you know, you were branded uh, somebody with psychopathology. So it's nothing new. It's not like, oh, the establishment is against us. What's going on now is that things are quasi encouraged with a kind of police on the internet. I'm speaking about the internet now because information is power. So something, somebody, you know, people, the establishment, whatever you want to call this, um, you know, motivational thing, this motive, the personification of the motive, they want information. They want to know how you think. Okay, so they want to know what your preferences are. Because marketing is just a measure of how we think and feel. It's a measure of desire. Okay, that's what marketing is. It's just, you know, they market things and then you say, oh, I want this one. One, I want that one, I want the other one, the preferences. So you are identified. You have you don't have a barcode, you don't have your your and of course you have your DNA and, and all of that, your social security, but you don't have the old 666 tattoo. What you have is a marketing profile, you know. And they, they say that, oh yeah, we do this, they legitimize it because it can't be concealed. You know, it's obvious. You're being profiled constantly. Why are you being profiled? Well, one thing I heard, and they sent it to me the other day on my, um, you know, uh, antivirus thing, is that, well, we have a new uh, antivirus type, you know, a protection program that basically protects you from profiling. Yeah, right. Um, because if people profile you, then they sell the information to companies. Then the companies, when you Google something, the, the search engine will register on your profile and give you the items that it believes you want first because of this data bank that's in your computer that it picks up on. So well, when that happens, you will then be prompted toward products, you know, and these products, the prices will be jacked up. Somebody who doesn't really match the profile for those products will get a far cheaper price than you because they know you want them. They know you're more likely to buy them, so they raise the prices just for you. Now that's just something that, you know, they always put it in terms of economics because the Westerners, are conditioned to justify it. To say, oh, it's only greed. We're all greedy, hey, maybe they get away with it a little more. I don't have to get really pissed off and start a revolution, you know, or something so horrific, like cannibalistic pedophilia or something that you get, uh, and you can't move, you can't react, you're just in shock. And then you get numb, 
So they keep you, you know, between these two extremes that uh, on the one hand, you shock numb, terrifying, so don't forget it, it's just I can't even face that. And the other one is, oh yeah, okay, we can just explain that. That's, yeah, it's just pissed off, it's, it's, it's immoral, but you know, what can you do, c'est la vie, we're all like that. You know, they, the middle ground of where you're actually fired up to get up and do something or actually creatively come up with something, you know, or at least stay awake, really instead of just telling yourself you're awake, um, that's expertly being avoided. And if anybody does come to that middle ground, a certain reasoning uh, that actually gets people to pay attention, then the trolls come in, on the internet at least, you know, because you have the internet where you're so bullied if you think differently. I mean, you can think uh, so-called liberal or you can be free or, or artistic or psychic or whatever, but these are all little categories. They're mainstream now. Alternative is now mainstream. It's just another form of mainstream. So people are no clue that they have been guided into the mainstream again, the mainstream, and they're marching to the beat of the same drummer, but there's counter rhythms and there's all these variants and all these things that are distracting that keep you complacent if you want to be. In other words, you have to keep fighting, mentally at least, to stay awake. To stay awake meaning to stay thinking in a way that isn't programmed, isn't contrived, because how do you know you're being programmed? You don't if you're asleep. Sorry, you know, that's it. You've given up your, your ability to, to discern when you fall asleep. And you don't know because you may feel comfortable, which is one of the symptoms of being asleep. Are you comfortable? You know, in your, in your psychology, I'm not talking about in your life. I'm not talking about, you know, oh, I don't get enough sleep. I'm not comfortable. I'm a bar, I'm full of toxins or I'm fighting or I'm doing this and arguments constantly with people. Yeah, but there's a certain sense of existential, shall we say, comfort, a comfort zone. With all the shit that's going on, I can still handle it. It's still, yeah, it's, you know, I'm, I'm there. But if you really feel shaken, out of place, uncertain, uh, even de depressed, you know. Depression is a sign that you actually have one eye open, you know. It's why, well, Ron, you know, you wake up in the, in the morning with the alarm clock, you got to go to work. It sucks. I haven't so needed an have alarm nice clock since I was a teenager. <laughs> yeah, okay. I but can wake up whatever time sleep. I need, no matter what. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you and the clock are friends. I mean, and that's a very rare thing today. One might consider it a very good thing. It's almost like you are compatible with the way the rhythm goes. And it, it might even allow you to get less sleep, you know, because there was someone I knew, and I know a lot of people who live a lot longer when they're on their own schedule. Everything has to be done at a precise time. They say, this time's this, that time's that. Oh, it's a 5.03. I need to have my salt water or whatever, my infusion, my this, my that, you know, I need to go to the bathroom now, it's 307, you know, every day the same thing, and they actually feel better and are masters of their lives because they are, ma they are friends with the clock, you know, but nobody can change their schedule, they have to do it as they know, that's one thing, uh, but if you can get people to conform to a common schedule, you resonate with them. The problem is somebody else gives up a lot more than you do, for example, for somebody who's with the clock. But again, know that this is not the topic of the conversation, the clock itself. The topic of the conversation is our adherence to uh, standard rhythms of normality, standard rhythms of, you know, consensus reality, shall we say. So a wake-up call is actually part of the system. You know, you need a clock to wake up, to be called. Somebody has to intervene. The clock itself intervenes. It's automatic. It's the alarm clock. We set it for ourselves. So we do have rhythms of desire. If you make an intention to wake up, you can and will wake up. But it doesn't guarantee that you will stay awake. If, shall we say, the human collective got fed up of the establishment, the establishment sociologists, you know, people in think tanks, read this. And also, we're not being programmed. No, what's going on maybe is that they're giving advice to companies, how to market us, how to manage us, giving advice to politicians, to royals, to this and that, how to keep us in line, to keep the peace and all of that. I don't know how you want to justify it, but 
The point is that people are establishing plans in think tanks on how to manage micro and mega manage humanity. We are being managed. We are being told, now we have to do this. Oh, climate change. Now you have to do this. Everybody gets on the bandwagon. There's all kinds of shit going on, but climate change, you know, because it is said so by the big megaphone somewhere. And a few little voices cry out and cry out and cry out, and they get slammed down because they go against the mainstream. I don't even want to hear about alternative anymore. There is no alternative. Forget it. Alternative is the stray that goes out of the mainstream and gets hunted down by the troll and, and brought back in or made to shut up, you know. So it, it isn't pessimistic, you know, because the, the title is how to treat a wake-up call. It's not how to stay awake. It's how to really treat the position of being slapped a little bit. Because sometimes, at least now that I'm noticing, and at least in things like social media and anywhere, there's this thing called controlled opposition. So you have these phony wake-up calls, you know, to distract you from the real ones, which means the real ones are going to get more intense because that's the desire within us. We don't want to be slaves. We don't want to be a regimented. You know, most people in society, their own wake-up calls are things like cancer, even though that's form a, a lot of it is toxicity, establishment stuff, this and that, you know. But a lot of it is giving up. A lot of it is depression, this mass depression. Yeah, chemically induced and all that, but... It, part of it is a symptom of wake-up call. Now, how do we respond to that? We can dive off a cliff. We can end our lives. We can just be even more normal. You know, we can wail at our fate. Your heart attack may have been a wake-up call. You know, these things are not pleasant all the time. Most of the time, they're not. So people who say, I'm awake, I'm awake, well, we don't really know. And to tell you the truth, we shouldn't really care unless we can constantly have a stream of perception, of feedback that tells us, yeah, I'm awake because I hear the snoring of everybody else. <laughs> but the point is, it's relative too, because the reason that I'm saying is it doesn't matter is because your eyes are best set on not just staying awake, but becoming more alert. You get out of bed, you want that cup of coffee, for example. You want to wash water on your face. You, you put water on your face. You want to uh, get out and get some fresh air. You want to wake up even more. You know, to the point that you're at peak condition and then you can make decisions. Until you're in peak condition, you cannot make decisions. So this point is, let's do something, you know, may be premature. The point is, let's just open our eyes and get the, you know, sleep out of them and all of this. Because there's going to be, it's, it's not even that anymore of, you know, oh, let's sweetly fall back asleep. Now it's like the clubs are going to start falling. Club us back into unconsciousness. And then, the, the, you know, and after that, who knows what? Because this is all for a reason, and the reason is exploitation. We don't have to make nightmares of demons from another dimension or aliens or whatever. Just say, pure and simple, human exploitation. One social group exploits the rest. Okay, it's that simple, you know, and I don't mean to say that I don't believe in this and that or the possibility. I mean to say, you know, there's so much shit going on for us to have sleepy people, you know, that we need to simplify the story. People created myths for that reason. They created myths to take all of the emotions that are really intense, that motivate you and inspire you and get you going, and turn them into events. These events can't happen, no, because your emotions are yours. Now, they may have happened, there may be elements to them. They, I don't, that's another area that's completely different. I don't believe in fighting between the so-called square reason and the round imaginative world because these things blend in us. Your reality is experienced from within. I'm not being metaphysical or new agey here. You know, these things are known. So the point is, is use your mythic, mythopoetic or mythopoeic, whatever, you know, I, I even say that, myth creative ability to your advantage. And don't say, oh, that's just a story. No, that's where your power is. Your power is in creating a myth. That's why we are led. First, we are hyper-rationalized in our world. So the, and, and basically, that's not the point. The hyper-rationalization is one thing. Evaluating the world through hyper-rationalization because data is being manipulated and your five senses are being regulated in, in a way. 
of what's real, what isn't, what's going on. History can be fabricated. It can be doctored a little bit. It always has been, you know. I'm not talking about complete fabrication, but who knows? Again, you cannot be sure. If people are even arguing about the flat earth, then you know that the degree of uncertainty that is being pushed. So I'm saying to set that aside as secondary, like I said before, the facts, you know, are not primary as much as the truth is primary. And the truth is within you, you know, because you are living your own existence. That's the only place the truth can be. It's not an external thing. It arises within you. And so, and it's always there because, you know, there is no, oh, it's just all lies. And, no, you exist. You know, that's the truth. You are there. And if you don't exist, something is there for providing a certain experience that is worth pursuing. If you don't feel it's worth pursuing, then, you know, it's sad for me because I kind of identify, you know, with us as a common humanity. That's almost like, well, then you're telling me that all my feelings are invalid. All my experiences of internalized subjectivity are invalid. And this is something that we notice is being promoted. And we also know what happens when somebody wants to subjugate somebody else or gaslight them, you know, or make them weak, then they invalidate them. They invalidate their beliefs. They invalidate them as an individual, you know, and we become dependent on this. We can't help it. We're social beings. So then the opposite happens. People are politically correct to avoid the impolite sensation of invalidating others. Oh, and that's also being manipulated because by not being true to ourselves, we end up invalidating ourselves for the sake of propriety imposed upon us because we are being shown videos of people throwing tantrums in their, in their special spaces or whatever. People who are bullied, then we identify, oh, now you're the bully. Well, you know, the way a bully really works is, is not just by brute force all the time. Sometimes it's subtlety, and they laugh at you, you know. They make you feel guilty about something that they do all the time, and even more, and they laugh at you because you're a joke to them. You can't be taken serious because you've agreed to invalidate yourself, you know. So the thing is, yes, but the truth is that the world sucks, but... The world sucks for a thousand million different reasons. So we each go on our own crusades thinking just to pat ourselves on the back. And it's always been that way. Affluent countries have always engaged in church charities and this, this and you're giving a little bit, a few coins there, a few things there. The thousand points of light that a certain president once said, you know, and we think we're doing something. And yet we are in our comfort zone. But if the shit happens to us, oh, Oh, you know, either we get up and fight and throw ourselves to the wolves or we just conform and bow our heads or we make another excuse or we sell out, you know. Again, we're solution-oriented. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but before you can go to a solution, you need to be resourceful. You need to be awake. The wake-up call needs to be put in a place where it is empowering, and that's not easy. So you see me talking for I don't know how many minutes I've been blabbing here, and I haven't been giving again as usual, uh, well, just lay it out for me. No, I don't want to lay it out for you, even if I could. Why? Because every piece of data that comes through this is being put somewhere, and where does it go? Well, maybe if I had an artificial intelligence, I'd plug it into the internet and just say, well, there it is, you know, you got all the information you need, learn how humans think. Learn how they can be manipulated. Learn what their preferences are. Learn the algorithms. Here, these are our algorithms. This is how we fuck with them. This is how we make them buy shit. Learn, learn, learn. And, you know, of course, we're apart in our own little internet, us, the they, that nobody's allowed, you know, that is a sign of uh, loony, loony bin compatibility if you talk about them, um, this indeterminate thing. But again, it's still reference. Um, and, you can have, you know, a certain class of people being off to the side on their own internet in their own secondary, what they, uh, certain people called it once an offshoot civilization or, or a branching civilization or, you know, something like that. I, I forget the term, but um, basically it's a civilization that branches off from the main one. The main one goes to shit, but the other one stays, you know. So it's almost like a colony, you know, so they can have their own clubs, 
people, a certain class can have their own clubs, their own uh, food supply, their own sources, their own factories that make products just for them, you know, and all right, and everything, you know. I'm not into class distinctions myself, but I know for a fact that if you look at the animal kingdom and even human behavior, that it's a tendency to striate, to create dominance and submission with a certain mindset. And humans are very, very manipulative, especially when they don't have empathy or when empathy has been deconditioned from them. We know this, and we tend to do the easy way of pointing fingers at each other. At this point, social media is a, a, a means of data collection for me as well. But, you know, and I'm not going to say, well, I'm disappointed. Well, that's natural. The point is that change is not going to come from a mass movement. That will only happen when micro events accumulate in a way, in a chaotic manner that cannot be predicted even by an AI. And this is why we're constantly being managed to lead to greater and greater events. We can either wait for that to happen or be true to ourselves and contribute to the pot, which, you know, you really don't need much to contribute. Everything, every change has happened by micro stimuli accumulating. And you can march to your own beat. You can create a new clock. You can create harmonics to go back and forth, you know, jazz improvisation. Think about music. Think about how rhythms are. Think about all the kind of things. Or you can dance the, this drummer in your own way and improvise. You can find things. The thing is wakefulness and creativity go hand in hand. If you find your creativity lacking, then you, it's easy to just re regulate yourself, relegate yourself to a, to a label of being uncreative. That might not be true. So... You know, in this case, in this age, um, where energy and money symbolize each other, life force and consciousness and information, and all of these things are blended together, this is an age of opportunity. It's not the age of being enslaved yet. We are enslaved in some ways. We are forced. We are coerced. That's a different thing. Slavery is something else. I said it before. It's a state that's far more, and when, they, when, when you're being conditioned to think you're a slave, you give up easier because a slave is a lifestyle that is, there's no way out, really. You know, liberating from slavery is far more difficulty, difficult than being liberated from coercion or resisting coercion or stopping coercion. So think about it this way, you know. Small steps. You can still do it, you know. This, this is the point of where I speak to individuals. I'm not speaking to a big group and, and seeking for mass movements and and Let's coordinate, let's do this, because right now, you know, everything you do is going to be food for the AI or somebody who wants to market you or market to you or just put it that way, you know, for whatever reasons. So if you want to be free, you got to do it in a way, in a very, very clever way, the way of the awakened person, okay? So if you don't know what that even means or aren't sure or think you're sure even, then Pay attention to wake-up calls. Some of them are pleasant, some of them are not. Some of them are subtle, some of them are strong. Some of them are forced and false. So it pays attention because when you really want something psychologically that has to do with the nature of truth, um, reality can form. That's when you create your reality. The nature of truth and your relationship to it, good, bad, or ugly, um, is the pivot and the key to... Uh, making reality move in the direction that you desire, okay? Otherwise, it's false. So that's my little piece of wisdom for the day, if you can contemplate it or think about it or, uh, you know, see if it means anything. It's a little paradoxical, but um, <laughs> it may lead somewhere. So with that, I will leave you, and thank you once again for listening to The Rant. Namaste. Thank you, Aristo. And the namaste means that we are all in the same boat, you know, in one way or another, maybe deeper than me. I recognize me in you. <laughs> That's what namaste means to me. Anyway. Okay, thank you.